You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is D.O. Thomas. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Author Stories. I'm Hank Garner, your host. You can find all of the archives at HankGarner.com. And while you're there, please subscribe to the show. It'll make sure you never miss an episode. We've been bringing you a series of very special shows this week. An Athon Books Showcase, where uh, we partnered with Athon Books, one of the very best publishers in science fiction and fantasy. And we've been featuring some of their authors all week long and trying to show you some of the great work that's coming out of Athon right now by hearing from some of their authors and featuring some audiobook clips from some of their new books. We've got a great show for you today with D.O. Thomas, who's got a fantastic new book that's uh, just about to come out. It's called Born of the Shade. You guys are really going to love it. And then at the end of the episode, we're going to have a special audiobook clip from Dean F. Wilson for his book, The Call of Aegon. It is absolutely fantastic. Now, without further ado, let's get into today's show with D.O. Thomas. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Daniel Thomas on the show with me today. He publishes under the name D.O. Thomas. And he has a fantastic new series uh, that is just about to launch on Athon Books. It's the Viventium series, and the first book is Born of the Shade. Uh, Welcome to the show, Daniel. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for joining me. Uh, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Hmm. My first memory wanting to be a storyteller I would say would probably be as far back as when I was a kid playing with Lego Um, I'd always have the characters and not the actual blocks just the little Lego people and I'd place them around the house and they'd go on these little adventures and stuff I probably had a little Lego ninja that had the deepest backstory you'd ever imagine (laughs) 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 he'd be fighting all my other toys and he was my favorite little uh, little character um, but then moving on to that, um, I'd say I, from computer games and stuff like that, I'd always pick up the stories and after I'd finished them in my head, I would then come up with what happens afterwards, if you know what I mean. Like I'd, I'd never just let a story lie. I'd always think of what could happen next and just, I'd always talk about it with my friends and we'd come up with crazy little ideas and stuff like that. So we'd always been a bit of a story maker. I love that. Did you come from a, a very creative family? Were there storytellers in your family or uh, anything like that? Um, my older brother, he would make up little things and stuff like that, but not really. There was not really any stories. I guess my dad would tell me stories about his past growing up in London as a um because he moved to London when he was 13 coming from the Caribbean and um he had a troubled history um at the time being black um there was a lot of NFs running around and he'd tell me stories about that and tell me that it's so much better now and things like that so those are the most stories I got from him, I'd say. Right. And and those, uh, it's interesting how kind of stories of conflict and uh, kind of uh, sometimes lend themselves to, um, you know, telling other stories. We take those and we see how people have, have dealt with hardship and, and how challenges come along. And uh, it's interesting to see how that stuff plays out in the mind of a kid. Yeah, um, because it it was always telling me the stories and showing me how much better things are now. So I see it struggle as a way to make things better. And I think I put that in my books as well. 
the were you a were you a big reader uh as a kid so i only ever read one set of books which was the discworld novels yeah uh by terry pratchett and the whole set pretty much i don't actually remember all of them now (laughs) because that'll take up a whole childhood yeah pretty much (laughs) i I think it did (laughs) but i had every single one of them and um i actually borrowed my first lot from my older brother and um i just fell in love with that world and just how he built such a rich world it was just amazing it was um i think that's pretty much the basis of what made me want to be a writer as well i'd say yeah well well being formed by sir terry pratchett uh uh can can instill in you a great love of story and probably make you a little twisted too along the way oh yeah definitely <laughs> uh he, he, from my books you could probably see i'm a little twisted <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, um, do you remember what it was uh, about the first Discworld book that uh, that just you know, changed the way you look at stories, or just you know pulled you into that world? Do you remember what the hook was that just resonated with you? So I was so young, I, I I don't think I could actually grasp it fully back then. But now it would, I would say it would be the cynicism. And the way his stories reflected on, like, real world, on the real world. But it's hard to explain it, really, isn't it? Um, it's just the, the way his books were like a parallel to how our world actually is, but in, in such a fashion that it's actually quite hilarious. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, the the thing that you recognize now as cynicism uh, yeah. probably came across as dark humor, or uh, you know, just as a as a younger person that you, maybe you don't yeah. quite get the cynicism, but you can tell he's poking fun at something. Yeah, definitely. It's it's the way he pokes at the world. It's and not necessarily things he disagrees with or anything like that, but just. He he shows you how funny things can actually be, even if they are quite dark. Right. If you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, one Hard of the things, <laughs> one of the things that I loved about Terry Pratchett and uh, and still love about his books is is he gives you permission to uh, to make fun of things, even even the things that you love, and and at yourself if you can't. If you can't have a little fun with yourself and, and realize kind of our place in the world and how weird it is and how, uh, you know, absolutely, um, you know, crazy that this whole thing is, um, then you'll probably go a little insane. And the, you know, the the ability to to look at yourself and find a little humor in it uh, is, is one of the things that I love. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. That is... <laughs> So, at what point uh, did you start? You know, other than the the Legos and the and the uh, the, the <laughs> ninja with the uh, you know epic backstory, <laughs> uh, at what point did you start telling stories of your own and and maybe committing to paper uh, and realizing that maybe you know that there there was something there? Well, I um I started off in high school. I was um I used to write poetry, and I would write poems in they were absolutely terrible <laughs> um but as I, most I high school write, poems are <laughs> yeah i tried to write um poems that told a story um they ended up as really really bad like kind of limerick um descriptions it was, it was absolutely awful and then i ended up um forming a little rap group in high school as well um that also was terrible <laughs> um but then, and with with rapping, you you try and tell a story with within uh, like sixteen bars, um, and you have a short amount of space to tell a a, a decent story. Um, so that was where I first started writing stories. Um, but then after that, I 
ended up doing like a, a kind of screenplay for a fanfic of a computer game called Final Fantasy. Um, and I, I played with that for about a year. Um, and then a friend of mine said, oh, let's uh, make a graphic novel. So I came up with um, Viventium and we were supposed to make that into a graphic novel. Um, but he ended up not doing the artwork. So I had these scripts um, for this just going unused for so long. And I think that one day I must have picked that up and then decided, oh, you know what, I'm going to turn this into a novel, not realizing how difficult that was actually going to be. <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> so I, I then basically just started working on it and working on it and rewriting the whole thing, um, the, the whole thing. And after about five years, I'd formed the basis of an actual novel. So, yeah. Your your time <clears throat> writing poetry and uh, and writing rap lyrics, uh, the thing that you'll learn uh, with both of those forms pretty quickly is that you need uh, to to really grasp the economy of words and saying yeah. a lot with a little, um, and and that's one thing that uh, that I think really can help a novelist is understanding how to paint a picture in a small space, uh, because what you're really looking for, uh, is an emotional reaction. You want to connect with someone emotionally so that your few words make a, a big impact. Um, do you, and, and whether, whether you're successful at it or not, I think those are lessons that we all take away from at least trying our hand at that. Um, do, do you feel like your time pursuing those things has helped you as a novelist? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I believe that I've gotten a grips of the English language quite well from doing those two things and, and trying to convey emotions and trying to, to bring forth emotions onto people, um, through lyrics or through poems. Um, and I, I put that into my books as much as I can. I, I try to create an emotional roller coaster, um, cause that's why people read, isn't it? <laughs> is they want to be gripped they want to be fully immersed into the story and the best way to immerse someone is to pull at those emotional strings your uh your new series uh viventium uh is is urban fantasy and uh, yes. I, I think that's safe to say um what is it about um and you know going back to terry pratchett which is which is not, uh, you know, it's, uh, Discworld is, is sort of an alternate universe. It's, uh, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, lends itself more to traditional fantasy, even with all of its uniqueness. Uh, but it's more yes. of a traditional fantasy. What is it about urban fantasy, uh, that, uh, that grabs your attention? Well, it's, it's the, the fact that in, so in the real world, there's, so many things that people don't really necessarily know about if you know what i mean so like you could walk down the street and see a like we will have a british heritage site around the corner from my house and i've never been there not once have i ever been there but i remember walking past it as a kid and thinking oh that could be where um the wizards go to to learn and stuff like that because it is such a strange building And then I kind of did that in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the kind of thing I, I think is that there's a lot of things that people don't really know or don't really see. And you can use those and put a fantasy aspect on them. I, I think that we're all intrigued, or at least a lot of us are, with the idea of the thing behind the thing. And uh, like... Life, uh, you know, the the mundane aspects of life, um, surely there's more to it than this. Um, you know, and when we see a car accident, uh, kind of the randomness of the universe is uh, uh, can be unsettling. And how fun it would be to imagine that there are, you know, dark and light forces uh, at, at battle behind this thing. And what we're seeing are, um, 
you know, the manifestations of that or whatever. That's, I, I think our, our imagination just kind of goes wild sometimes because we want to believe that there's something more, that we're more than human uh, at times. Uh, is that, are that some of the themes that you're playing with here? Um, yeah, I definitely have that in there. I have um, quite a few uh, things where I'll have it so that, um, cause I do have the dark and light, but then it kind of mixes into the gray area to a point where everything kind of has a story behind it. So you don't really meet a character without getting to know them and their story and what's led them to you meeting them within the story. And it's, um, so, cause I, I kind of see that in the world where literally everything has a story behind it, whether it's the chair you're sitting on or you know the person you met in the shopping center you know that everyone and everything has a story so it's, it's that's kind of one of the one of the driving forces to, for me to write as well when uh, you said this began uh, as a graphic novel or at least the idea yeah. for a graphic novel what, what was the original inspiration when when you first started dreaming up this world and these characters what, what were the first things that came to you about it Ooh. Um, first things that came to me about it. Ah, so we we were having a conversation, and I I I said, "What if all myths were real? What if human history is just a cover up for the actual things that happened?" So all the elven, uh, sorry, all the um, Greek gods and um sorry um uh norse gods and the egyptian gods what if they were all elves that used to control the world and humans saw them as gods but then they disappeared and now they're just myths and there's some kind of driving force behind it that's covered everything up and what if there's a supernatural world that is all just hidden and that kind of became the basis of the Viventium series. Uh, what is Viventium? Uh, so Viventium is Latin for living or the living. And that's kind of the, uh, the whole point is that these are, this is the story of the living, the people that live in, in this world. And then there's, you have like heaven and hell as well. So that's where the dead live. And so the whole story is about people that are living in that world. I, I love the idea of treating um, myths and legends as real. Um, I, I actually have a series that I'm working on for Athon right now that that takes a little bit of that. Um, I think Neil Gaiman's American Gods, you know, takes yeah, uh, from that, that so same kind of concept. Um, there's something so beautiful about just removing. Uh, the cynicism of the world and it, you know, kind of the opposite of what we we're talking about, Terry Pratchett, but, yeah, uh, but, it's, true. but, but I think we, we, we need to, to explore the cynicism sometimes so that we can then take the shackles off of the cynicism and, uh, uh, and, and open the creativity that way because we, we understand it a little better maybe. Um, but that when you, when you just go with the assumption that, that all the things that have been passed down are real, um, it really opens up just endless opportunities. What, what were some of the funnest uh, or the most fun legends, myths that, uh, that you got to explore in this? Oh, um, so it, it's the, uh, ooh, a lot of spoilers there in that <laughs> question. <laughs> well, whatever you're comfortable talking about. Just... Um, so I've had a lot of fun with vampire nation and the werewolves. And bringing that into, so um, the Norse god Loki, he was rumoured to have had, no, well, the myth was that he had three children, which was um, Fenrir, the, uh, the giant wolf, and I made that the first werewolf. Um, Hela, who is half dead and half alive, that was the first... Um, 
a vampire and then you've got Jormungand which is the world serpent and I made that the first dragon so those are the three ancestors of the vampires werewolves and dragons that you have today in the book um so I, I have a lot of fun with the myths um and kind of tweaking them and changing them and then bringing them forward into modern day because when you, you treat those as history you have to kind of see how they evolve into the now Does that makes sense yeah absolutely <laughs> um <laughs> tell me about the character of noir where, where did this character come from so noir is he's kind of the the chaotic neutral of this world um again there's a, quite a few spoilers within his character to answer that question um he has he's an information broker and he plays between the lines across the board and has his finger in every single pie going he you never really know whether he's good or evil or if he's just out for himself he's he's that guy that seems to push the for, the story forward and just bring people together and move people around and sometimes tear people apart quite literally um, <laughs> <laughs> he my my inspiration for him just comes from just the like every story you always have a good guy who's just that basic good guy i didn't really want to do that so i i just took every villain i knew every good guy i knew every neutral person i knew and i kind of just threw them all together and came up with noir and uh and how do you you know when you're dealing with a kind of a big meta story like this how do you decide where to bring uh readers in how, how what's our entryway into this world and this story uh, so it starts with a blue moon um which doesn't happen very often as as everyone knows um and it's literally just noir running to get to where the light of the blue moon hits someone and that light will then infuse that person with a with a power that turns them into a shadow fiend so it starts with him searching for this going to find this shadow fiend and then after that it's all just the fallout from what happened during the blue moon because the blue moon affects every supernatural creature differently and things were a bit chaotic that night so the story moves forward with um, the supernatural world in a bit of a tizzy after um, Noir didn't do his job properly by warning everyone for, of the blue moon. He was busy looking for this new shadow fiend and the shadow fiend's quite special, but I can't really go into that. <laughs> when um, when the book opens, uh, what is what is the conflict that you use to to uh to kick off the the story we talked earlier about how important conflict is uh, but what do you use to get us into this world ah so it goes between a lot of the characters um so you get this first book is a, an introduction to the world and you see the, the politics between um so we have the zodiacs who are the law um the law keepers and um the werewolves they have an issue because they can't um control themselves because of the blue moon and it goes from the first conflict i would say is the a fight between one of the zodiacs and one of the werewolves where he un the it ends with um oh, i can't really say that can i no <laughs> um so it, it's basically the, uh, <laughs> the the conflicts are just the fallout from the blue moon and the way it's affected them and then it, it kind of leads up into the story the main story once you get to know your 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 first set of characters 
when as this began as a graphic novel and which by by nature is a serialized uh story in in smaller chunks uh that that tells one big overarching story but yes. uh you know you, you've got all of these little emotional payoffs that go all along through it to keep readers engaged and um as you translated this into a novel and you kind of alluded to it a, a few minutes ago that you know the challenges of of taking this and making a novel of it what were some of the things that you learned about storytelling uh from from taking this from one form into this longer form it would be the descriptions are uh, um you have to really get the descriptions on point and you have to move it forward well and the the scene changes are very important it's it's everything needs to flow into each other perfectly or else it's all just a mess whereas with the graphic novel you literally just write the dialogue and that was it so the kind of figuring out the narrative structure as opposed to yes. just having everything around come. So, so, you know, one of the big challenges is then describing the world because you don't have someone drawing the world out for you. Um, yeah. what are some of those challenges? Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of like you having someone walking down the street. You, you can't just say they're walking down the street. Can you, you have to say what the street was like, what, their their personal experience of because everyone has a different experience of doing anything so what their personal experience was and what they seeing as they're doing it and how they feel about doing that and um what's going through their head as they're walking and how you know the the shadow um crossing the road it looks a certain way to them because they're freaking out about having strange shadow powers and stuff like that so it's <laughs> all right it's, it's, it, um it's, it's just bringing everything together and, and creating a full visual effect through words um it started off very challenging and then after quite a few tweaks i think i've got it on point now <laughs> great um you know, when you're dealing with uh, myths and legends and things that a lot of people are very familiar with, because we've heard these kinds of stories over and over, yes. um, what what are some of the challenges of of keeping with tradition uh, as opposed to um, you know, mixing things up to put your new spin on it? So I, I find um, switching up the the mythology uh mythology quite easy um because if you look at our actual history unless there's something written down it's all just conjecture like you, unless it's a written down fact it, someone's made it up if you know what i mean so with the mythology it is basically mostly made up so you can mess around with it, if you know what I mean. So it's, I, I'll do my research, find out what the truth, what the true belief is, and then I'll play with that to make it fit the narrative while trying to stick to the, the original uh, content as much as I can. Gotcha. Um, you, you said this is going to be a six book series, uh, all yes. in all what, uh, where, w when we finish this book and we're trying not to give spoilers because we want people yeah. to, to go grab it. Um, uh, do you have a plan for the whole series out or are you kind of discovering the bigger story as you go? So I'm, I'm an avid pantser, but I do know how it ends. Um, I, I have major plot points that I know I need to put in there, but I do let the characters guide me because um, the, the characters are very organic and there are a lot of them. Um, I have certain plot points that I need to hit, but for the most part, I do kind of go into it naturally. Which book in the <laughs> series are you working on? Um, halfway through, well, a little bit more than halfway through book four. Oh, nice.
Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, what? Any idea what your publishing schedule is going to be for the series? Um, I think that's up to the publishers. <laughs> um, I should finish this book um, by the end of the year, I believe, and then depending on how much time I managed, because I'm not a full-time writer, I, I write probably twice a week. Um, I try and get through uh, maybe a book a year. Well, the new book is called Born of Shade. It's the first book in the Viventium series. Uh, Daniel, this has been so much fun talking. I am really excited about this series, and we're going to send everyone... Uh, to pick it up when you're hearing this, uh, the book will be out in just a couple of weeks. It's up for pre-order now, and there's a link in the show notes where you can go pre-order uh, Born of the Shade. And I, if I know the uh, the Athon guys, uh, then book two is going to be up for pre-order very soon after that. And it uh, looks like we're going to have lots of great urban fantasy coming our way in the near future. Um, Daniel, if people are just learning about you, is there uh, is there anywhere online where they can connect with you and and dig into all that you do. Oh yes, yeah. so I have um Facebook page which is Dio Thomas Official. I have an Instagram which is Dio Thomas. Um I think I'm the only Dio Thomas that's on Instagram. And my Twitter is at Dio Thomas X. Great. We'll include those uh, in the show notes of the episode. Uh, Daniel, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you for having me. Sit tight. We're not finished yet. Stay tuned now for a special audiobook clip from The Call of Aegon by Dean F. Wilson. An Athon Books production. Evron watched the head cleric, Teron with growing unease, until every movement or gesture was like the threat of something sinister. A curious glance became a stabbing glare, and a shift in seat became an ominous betrayal of a hidden agenda. Ifron clutched the side of the table like a shield, while fear seized his heart and stayed his breath. He hung on the edge of his seat, as he hung on the words of Teron. "'We are running out of time,' Teron said grimly, their ships should be here within hours. I know, Ephron said, but the waver in his voice revealed his doubt. He'd been waiting for this moment for a very long time. It was his daily dread. Prayer was as common as air in the monastery, but Ephron's only true prayers were that it would not come to this, that he would not have to run again. Ephron was almost certain that Teron knew about his flight that he had come to the monastery in Larksong not as a true follower of Ola, but as a follower of his fears, as if, sensing his thoughts, Teron settled a cruel glare upon him. The fire that burned in those eyes was more powerful than Ephron could ever dream, but looking past those flames, Ephron saw a shadow, and this unsettled him. "'Do you believe in coincidence?' Teron asked, and Ephron felt the question probe his mind before he could answer. His thoughts began to scatter and the juices in his mouth dried up, forcing him to give a faint cough in reply. Teron leaned forward a little, his face cowled in shadow. Do you believe you are here for a reason? There was a short pause, but it felt like eternity, uncomfortable and unsettling. And then the head cleric began again. Ephron, he said, his voice commanding using the sound of his companion's name as a key to unlocking his mind. You are not making this any easier for yourself. Feigning the fool will not get you out of this room any quicker. When I ask you questions, I expect answers. I expect confessions. This was no longer a meeting. It was an interrogation. Each passing moment felt like the drawing of a noose, each probing question the tightening of the rope about his neck. So let me ask you again. Do you believe you are here for a reason? Yes, Ephron said, but it was an uncertain one. He had been running from that reason for a long time now, hoping it would pass him by, pick some other person, choose some other fool. Terran knew more than he let on. It was hard to tell just which of one's dark secrets he had access to. 
Our purpose is said to have long been decided, our side in any battle carved in stone. Do you really believe that someone's will cannot be swayed? He shifted in his seat and held his hand aloft, as if indeed he were casting some spell of sway upon Ephron. Sometimes it is swayed long before the swayer has any say, Ephron tried boldly. In that moment the light breeze that seemed forever present in the drafty monastery grew stronger, and the jumping fire of the solitary candle cast a darker shadow upon Teron's face. His eyes grew dim. Yes, and sometimes the offer is too good to refuse, Teron stated, drawing closer across the table. Ivron could almost imagine his long, bony fingers reaching out to maul him. The light shifted again, exposing new details while hiding old ones. Teron's hair seemed much more grey here in the dark than it did in the open cloister, and his rugged beard masked his mouth as if to further veil the beguiling words that came out of it. It was his eyes, however, that seized all who looked upon them. They were dark, deep rifts of age and wisdom. Ephron feared this, as if he knew that this wisdom could indeed sway him. You watch me with uneasy eyes, Teron noted. He withdrew back into the shadows again, but his presence lingered. I wonder if you have watched as carefully the moving pieces on this earthly board that has led now to our... conversation. I have watched many things, Ephron said, and listened to the whisper of others. Then you know as much as I do, Teron remarked. Or more? Yes, perhaps you know more. Is it not your duty, then, to reveal unto your head, cleric, that which you have been concealing? My duty here is to uphold the ways of Ola. Teron laughed, and the sound was like thunder by a god whose servants have failed to appease him. This was not the voice of mirth, it was mockery. So you laugh at your clerics, Ephron said. No. Teron replied, scolding him with his eyes. Only you, because you are the only one to come to me and feign piety when we both know that it's neither what made you join us nor what kept you here after you joined. I am many things, Ephron, but I am not a fool, and those who treat me like one have been given mercy if they are greeted by my laughter and not my lash. Why then did I come here? Ephron asked. It was as much a question for his own ears as any other's, a question he often asked on the frequent lonely nights spent locked away in his small, cold room. To hide, Teron said. Not that you have been that successful at it. I've been here ten years, and I have known your purpose for nine of those. Why then let me stay? Because I care for you, Ephron, even if you are not truly a follower of Ola.